Hi folks, good to see you. Question, how does your telescope's focal length and f ratio actually affect what you see or photograph in the night sky? Is there something like a magnification limit? And are fast f ratio telescopes always better for astrophotography? I'm Rido Willemans, an astrophotographer from Utrecht, the Netherlands, and you are watching Rido's Astroform. Let's start with focal length. That's the distance from your telescope's lens or mirror to the point where that light comes into focus, where you place your eyepiece or camera. It is usually measured in millimeters. With refractor and Newtonian telescopes, the focal length is roughly the same as the physical length of your telescope. For example, my 600 mm focal length APO refractor telescope has a physical length of 540 mm. However, some designs like schmidt cassegrain or Maxitov telescopes have a folded light path using multiple mirrors, letting you get a longer focal length in a much shorter tube. For example, my Edge HD 8 inch has a 2032 mm focal length, but only a 432 mm physical tube length. So why is focal length important? Well, because it directly affects the magnification and your field of view. A longer focal length means higher magnification, but a narrower view. A shorter focal length means a wider view, but a lower magnification. Let's break this all down for both visual astronomy and astrophotography. For visual astronomy, focal length relates to magnification and it's pretty easy to calculate. Just divide your telescope's focal length by your eyepiece's focal length. So a 2000 mm telescope with a 40 mm eyepiece will give you 50 times magnification. Swap in a 10 mm eyepiece and you are at 200 times magnification. So what does that mean visually? Let's take the moon as an example. With that 40 mm eyepiece, the moon looks 50 times larger than it does to the naked eye. You will see it nicely framed with lots of surface detail. Switch to a 10 mm eyepiece and you will get 200 times magnification. Now the moon fills your whole view and you will see craters and find textures of the moon up close. Now you might be wondering, do objects like the full moon always fit in the view of my eyepiece? This brings us to field of view. For visual astronomy that's related to the patch of sky you can see through your eyepiece and to calculate it simply divide the eyepiece's apparent field of view by the magnification. So, for example, my 14mm eyepiece has an apparent field of view of 46 degrees. We already established that with my 2000mm telescope, this eyepiece will give me 50 times magnification. So, the true field of view is now calculated by 46 divided by 50, which brings us to 0.92 degrees. That's almost a full degree and plenty of room to see the full moon, which is about 0.5 degrees in the night sky. If I use that same eyepiece on the 600 mm focal length telescope, the magnification is 600 divided by 40 is 15 times. So the true field of view becomes 46 divided by 15, which is a bit over 3 degrees wide. That's wide enough to fit the moon 6 times over. And even the Andromeda galaxy, which spans about 3 degrees in the night sky. If math isn't your thing, no worries. I've included simple magnification and field of view calculators for visual astronomy on my website blog. Links are in the video description below. You will probably notice that I added the reducer Barlow multiplier in each of my calculators. These are additional lenses you can use in combination with your eyepiece to adjust your magnification. Barlow lenses increase your telescope's effective focal length, making objects appear larger but dimmer. Reducers do the opposite. They shorten the focal length, giving you a wider and brighter field of view at a lower magnification. For example, 1000 mm focal length becomes 2000 mm focal length with a 2 times Barlow or 500 mm with a 0.5 reducer. So you might be wondering how far can you push that magnification? Well, that mostly depends on your telescope's aperture, the quality of your optics and your local seeing conditions. I explained those limits in more detail in a previous video about telescope aperture and you will find the link in the video description below. But let me give you some quick advice here. When it comes to visual observing, a good rule of thumb for maximum useful magnification is about 50 times per inch 
or two times per millimeter of aperture of your telescope. That's assuming you got excellent optics and great astronomical seeing conditions. So for an eight inch or 200 millimeter aperture telescope, that gives you a theoretical maximum magnification of around 400 times. Under average skies, however, you'll usually get the sharpest view somewhere between 200 and 300 times of magnification. One exception is planetary observations where high magnifications can really shine and where people often push the limits of their telescope. Let's switch to astrophotography where things work a little bit differently. Interestingly, astrophotographers like myself usually don't talk about magnification. Instead, we focus on field of view and image scale, which are both determined by your telescope's focal length and your camera's sensor size. Let's start with field of view and take an APS-C size sensor like my ASI 2600MC Pro as an example. The camera's sensor size is 23.5 by 15.7 millimeters, which is roughly the same size as the crop sensor in many DSLR or mirrorless cameras. To calculate the field of view in degrees, you can use this formula. Let's say I'm using the ASI 2600MC Pro with my 600mm focal length telescope. My horizontal field of view is now 23.5 divided by 600 times 57.3 is about 2.24 degrees and my vertical field of view is now 1.5 degrees. That's a pretty wide field of view and perfect for larger objects like the Andromeda Galaxy, which spans about 3 degrees across the sky. I have captured this galaxy diagonally with this setup and it's just fitted the field of view showing its wonderful dust planes and nearby satellite galaxies. Now let's switch to my Edge HD 8 inch with its 2032 mm focal length using the same camera. At this focal length, my horizontal field of view is now 23.5 divided by 2032 times 57.3 is about 0.66 degrees and my vertical field of view is now 0.44 degrees. That's over three times narrower as compared to my 600 mm telescope and perfect for smaller objects like M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is only about 11 times 9 arc minutes in the night sky. That's about 0.18 degrees in angular size. Barlow lenses and reducers are also common in astrophotography. For example, with my 2032mm focal length telescope, the full moon, which is about 0.5 degrees in the night sky, just doesn't fit my vertical field of view at 0.44 degrees. And that frustrated me. So I have an extra 0.7 reducer that widens my field of view to 0.95 times 0.63 degrees. Vice versa, Barlow lenses are especially popular for detailed moon and planetary imaging. I have a field of view calculator in my blog, so if you don't like to do the math yourself, you can use that calculator. So you could also ask, is there a maximum magnification rule in astrophotography? Well, as I mentioned earlier, in astrophotography, we usually don't focus on magnification. Instead, we talk about field of view, which we just covered, and image scale. And image scale tells you how much of the sky each pixel in your camera image represents. It's usually measured in arc seconds per pixel. That's how much sky is covered by each pixel in your image. This depends on two things. Your camera's pixel size in microns and your telescope's focal length. Here's the formula. So let's do the math. The pixels on my ASI 2600MC Pro camera are 3.76 microns each. Paired with my 600mm focal length APO refractor, that gives me an image scale of about 1.29 arc seconds per pixel. And yes, of course, I've created a handy calculator on my blog you can use to figure this out for your own astrophotography gear. Now, for deep sky astrophotography, a typical image scale sweet spot is around 1 to 2 arc seconds per pixel, depending on your local seeing conditions. For example, here in the Netherlands at sea level, astronomical seeing is often limited to around 1 to 2 arc seconds. So pushing much beyond that wouldn't make much sense for me. It wouldn't actually give me much sharper photos of the object. But at prime observing sites like Mount Taide in Tenerife, Mauna Kea in Hawaii, or Dome C in Antarctica, 
the seeing conditions are much better, often well below one arc second. In those locations, using an image scale smaller than one arc second per pixel makes total sense to capture finer details. Another exception is planetary imaging, where it is common to aim for 0.1 to 0.3 arc seconds per pixel to capture fine details like Jupiter's cloud bands, Saturn's Cassini division, or Mars's polar ice caps. Barring lenses are often used in combination with small pixel planetary cameras to reach this fine scale. This works because planetary imaging is all about recording video at high frame rates and then stacking the sharpest frames. By doing this, we can effectively beat the astronomical seeing, as it is called, and recover much more detail than a single photo would show. If you're interested, I have an online three-hour planetary imaging course for my channel members. Links in the video description below. A big thanks to everyone who supports me financially by joining the channel. You make it possible for me to create all this content about astrophotography. You're awesome! So now that we've covered focal length and length, pun intended, there's another topic that causes a lot of excitement and confusion among both visual astronomers and astrophotographers. The F-Ratio. Focal ratio or F-number is the ratio between a telescope's focal length and its aperture. For example, a telescope with an 800 mm focal length and a 200 mm aperture has a focal ratio of F4. So, what is the function of F-Ratio in visual astronomy and astrophotography? So, in visual astronomy, the F-Ratio relates to the exit pupil. That's the width of the light beam that reaches your eye. Here's the formula. For example, when I use a 40mm eyepiece with an F7 telescope, it gives me an exit pupil of 5.71mm, while a 10mm eyepiece brings that down to 1.43mm. A larger exit pupil gives a brighter view up to the limit of your eye's dilation, which is typically around 7mm in the dark. If the exit pupil exceeds that, your eye can't use that extra light, so brightness maxes out at 7 mm. But when it's smaller, changes in exit pupil have a big impact. For example, increasing from 3 mm to 6 mm gives you about 4 times more light, making the image noticeably brighter in your eyepiece. For bright solar system objects like the moon and the planets, a 1 to 3 mm exit pupil is ideal. It boasts sharpness and contrast without needing the extra brightness. For deep sky objects, however, you'll want an exit pupil closer to 7 mm. And yes, I actually do have an exit pupil calculator on my blog. All right, let's move on to astrophotography. Astrophotographers like me use a telescope bound to track objects and capture long exposure images. Instead of looking through an eyepiece, we collect light over time with a camera to reveal faint details that are invisible to the naked eye. The focal ratio plays a big role in how quickly the camera sensor gathers light. Lower f-ratios produce brighter images. Halving your f-ratio from f10 to f5 actually quadruples the light hitting your sensor. The actual calculation would be 10 squared divided by 5 squared is 100 divided by 25 is 4 times faster. So now you know why fast telescopes with low f ratios are so appealing to astrophotographers. They deliver more light to the sensor, allowing for shorter exposures. For example, if an F10 telescope needs 60 seconds to collect enough light, a faster F5 telescope can do it in just 15 seconds. That's four times faster. Shorter exposure times help reduce issues like tracking errors and make it quicker and easier to capture faint objects. All right, so if fast focal ratio telescopes are so great, why doesn't everybody use them? Well, there are a few reasons. Fast telescopes can introduce optical aberrations like coma, which makes stars near the edges look elongated and blurry. To correct that, you usually need additional optics like coma correctors or field flatteners, which add both cost and complexity. Also, fast telescopes tend to have a smaller, usable, 
image circle that's perfectly sharp. So if you use a large format camera sensor, you might notice softness or vignetting towards the edges of your frames. Another challenge is that fast focal ratio telescopes typically have a very short back focus, leaving limited room for accessories like filter wheels, off-axis guiders, or heavier cameras. Plus, achieving precise focus can be trickier because the depth of focus is very shallow. Even tiny focusing errors can cause your stars to appear soft or out of focus. Please don't get me wrong, if you want to capture wide field objects quickly, ultra-fast telescopes like the F2 Celestron Raza series are very tough to beat. These telescopes are specifically designed for astrophotography and offer impressively flat, well-corrected fields. Moving up in focal ratio, medium-speed telescopes, those around F4 to F8, are the real workhorses in astrophotography. These include fast Newtonian telescopes and APO refractors. They offer a great balance. Wide enough fields to capture star clusters and galaxies, but also enough focal length to bring out details in smaller objects. Plus, you can easily add reducers or Barno lenses to fine-tune your field of view, making these telescopes very versatile. Higher focal length telescopes around F10 and above are ideal for detailed planetary and lunar observations and imaging. Telescopes like schmidt cassegrains and Maxitov telescopes fall into this category. They provide higher magnification and narrower fields of view, which is perfect for showing surface details on the Moon, Jupiter and other planets. The downside is that longer exposures are needed for deep sky objects, so a good quality tracking mount becomes essential. Alright, if you liked the video, please consider subscribing or joining the channel. It really helps me to create content like this and I'd appreciate it a lot. I'm Guido Urlebans. Clear skies.